Today, an all new on the Limited Report. We're joined by senior lecturer in politics and international studies at Rhodes University, Dr. Sipoga Zimakaza, who is here to enlighten us on her scholarship on the role of women and girls in war and combat. Dr. Sipoga Zimakaza completed her doctoral study looking at the role of women in the MK struggle and she interviews MK veterans and she is here to give us the lowdown on that study which she is currently turning into a manuscript and we certainly look forward to that book here on the Liberty Report. I first met Dr. Sipoga Zimakada a few years ago when I was doing my Masters in Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes University and I remember I attended one of her lectures and I was so blown away because she had opened the lecture with a big statement on the slide that said good girls go to heaven and bad girls go everywhere and since then I have been a big fan and a follower of Dr. Sipoga Zimakada's work and have actually seen her receive the Rhodes University's Vice Chancellor's Teaching Distinguished Award and she's joining us here on the Liberty Report. To start off our conversation, I asked her, what is it about the home front that we can't seem to comprehend as a war zone? The experience of us in South Africa is that people, you know, young people, elderly people were arrested in the homes. I think Sarafina does give us that visual reality, representative reality of how apartheid worked. People were arrested in funerals, in churches, in the schools. So most of the women I interviewed for my study, you know, there was, there was the generation of the 1960s, um, many of them who participated uh, in rural uh, former Transkai in Mkanduni, these were older women. But I quickly noticed that many of those who left the country, most of the women who left, or the young people in general, who left to join Mkondo Asizwe, were part of what is known as the June 16 detachment. So most of them left after the uprisings of 1976. So those were young people in high school and even primary. You know, I mean, the, the youngest person I interviewed said she left for, for Lesotho at the age of nine years. Wow. Because she wanted to fight against the violence that her family and community was experiencing. So this is the intimate part of the violence at the heart of it, um, you know, um, women and men, of course, experienced it, the violence in their daily lives where police would come, you know, searching for a document, searching for a family member and basically um, just mess up the house on a daily basis. What I also want to be careful of and what I learned as I was doing this work is that we don't want to glamorize the experience of the MK combatants who, who were trained in places like Angola, like Cuba, like the Soviet Union, uh, mm -hmm. such as Germany. Because what I realized in doing this work is that the, that number of, of, of women and men actually constitute um, a, a smaller number of, of, of combatants compared to the combatants that remained in South Africa. So because they're trained, they, there is this, uh, I don't want us to over glamorize the extent to which that contribution uh, ended apartheid. The ultimately all, I mean, all of the uh, uh, operations that MK had to undertake in infiltrating combatants into South Africa had to rely on a very close co uh, cooperation or collaboration between those combatants outside the country, many of them infiltrated through Lesotho, through Swaziland, through Botswana, with combatants inside the country. So when I interview mm -hmm. combatants of Amabuto, in Port Elizabeth, they say, we saw ourselves as carrying out the mandate of Umkondo Wesizu. So what tends to happen um, is that we tend to venerate the formerly trained combatant. Because in broader feminist theory, people like Yuval Davis have said, have argued that maybe if we can prove that women can fight like men, maybe then they will achieve full citizenship. 
That is the argument. But the reality now, 20, what is it? We are now 27 years into democracy. And what we've learned from the experiences of women combatants in Zimbabwe who did fight side by side with men is that that is simply not true. The fact that women indeed were trained exactly like the men uh, were. Tandi Modisa speaks about this all the time. People, Minister Lindy Wazulu, all of them speak about this all the time that we received similar training in Umkondo season. It is different to the experience of white women in the, in the old South African Defense Force. They were not allowed into combat. Women in Umkondo Wesizwe were received the same training, did the same routines as the men. But our experience is that even when they are able to prove that they can do the same exact things, it has not meant that uh, we see more work being written about their heroism. You see, this is why we have such limited work about women combatants in this country. So I don't want to, I, don't, I would not want my work to fall into that trap where we venerate a certain kind of women. Because in my view, the experience or the kind of work that has been done around Mama Tigizela Mandela, for example, is to show the centrality of the people that remained in the country. And so there's a big debate in mm. better in ex combatant literature in South Africa about how do we define a combatant? If many indeed were trained in Angola and yet where were the hippos? Were the hippos not in the South African townships, in the Bantu stands? Were they not in the schools? Who were the people that were killed who carried the coffins of the Craydog Four? Were they not the people that remained in the country? Many of the uh, former combatants are interviewed in Port Elizabeth who were teenagers in the 1980s were at the funeral of the Craydog Four. Nyameka Goniwe, the wife of Matthew Goniwe, recounts the atmosphere of the burial of her husband in a short documentary about the Craydog Four. She says, it was as if the ground was moving. It was just defiance. A statement which was being conveyed to the government that there is nothing that you are going to be able to control. I can't even explain that kind of spirit. It was a funeral, but I felt like it was a liberation day for many. I think that I think that is what lifted me that day. So I argue that funerals, especially so in the 1980s, were sites of combat because this is where people were, were killed. And so the combatants in Port Elizabeth talk about how they did a guard of honor you know, uh, uh, during funerals in order to see whether or not they are, when their parted forces were coming and ensure that they protected their people. So in talking about the roles of MK combatants in exile, I never wanted to undermine the, the very important role of the civic movements that emerged in the 1980s of the self-defense units in the 1980s because the combat was in South Africa and across Southern Africa. From African studies, African art, and African traditions and cultures, women have been revered and, and, and respected um, quite a lot. And I wonder what, what, what informed this um, er eradication of women's contribution in our climate, in, in, in the African climate. So as you say, it is it is absurd. So um, that in a context where the woman is so central um, in really in in building up and maintaining the homestead, it is absurd that there would be the expectation that she would she would sit out sit out the war for liberation. <laughs> you know, of course, where you know her own bodily autonomy is under attack and the bodily autonomy of her loved ones is under attack. It is absurd. I think what tends to happen, and this is the trap that we find ourselves in, is that we think within disciplines, and but most of the time as an African, and as, a, as an African feminist, you actually have to think against those disciplines. Um, because I remember, you know, um, I mean, this uh, inter interview I will share in the, in the late, in the upcoming work, you know, with uh, retired General um, Spiwa Nyanda, 
and I was asking him, you know, he was the chief of the former chief of the South African Defense Force. I say, but you people don't deny that this was a guerrilla war. It was not a conventional war. You know, it was, if one goes back to that sort of core work about guerrilla war uh, from Mao Zedong, from Che Guevara, there both of them say the success of a guerrilla war is its intimate link between the army and the population. And so whether you are entering it through the rural areas or through the urban areas, but you can actually cannot succeed without the collaboration of the population. So many of the elder women I interviewed who did not consider themselves as combatants, you know, they used to hide, uh, you know, young women and men um, who were running away from the apartheid forces in their homes. And mm -hmm. they used to put their lives at risk I mean, one of them said she she slept on the floor for two years because at one point a bullet came through her home, you know, and I say, oh, I, I mean, how do we not define that as combat, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th this is where, I mean, so when I, for instance, you know, the, the, the leaders of the uh, Amabuto Self-Defense Unit, when they took me to the, the women that were involved in Amabuto, they would say, oh, we used to jump over her fence, mom so-and-so's fence, you know, when we were running away from the police. And, and, we, and she used to direct us to, to use a particular uh, gate or particular hideout, you know. So women had to think strategically about this. I remember uh, Umam Deh saying, you know, we used to read these political books and, and put them inside the Bible, <laughs> you know, and then go ahead and have our... Our, our, our political conversation using the word, you know, the technology of the church, but we knew what we were talking about. Of course, this is what uh, uh, Dr. Mandela and Imam Matikzela Mandela talk about, that they had to use that language when they were writing each other letters from Robben Island to have uh, these conversations by using codes. This was everywhere in how people survived. Uh, apartheid. So one of the veterans I interviewed, you know, she says, in the integration process of the new South African Defence Force, we humiliated our veterans. So someone who had who, who left in the 60s, spent their entire lives, you know, their two, three decades, leading and thinking, strategizing about the armed struggle, who then didn't have educational qualifications becomes undermined during the integration process. Mm -hmm. Then you say, oh, but you don't compare with so-and-so, usually a white former conscript in the, in the old defense force, the majority of the combatants who were in South Africa were not integrated into the defense force, into the new defense force. Some of them were, and I interviewed a woman who was in a self-defense unit in Pretoria, in Mamelodi, she was integrated into the South African Defense Force. Some were integrated into the police, but in the main, you know, the request was that you needed to prove, you needed to have a force number, you know, but that is not how the war was fought. And so when you do that, when you use those categories, ultimately, the majority of women are outside of that. Moms, mom, dad, you know, mom and Ziwa, who was, you know, basically guarding young men in in um, in Kwaza, Kele, is not going to qualify to be part of the new defense force, even if she wants to do that. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the, I mean, part of the sort of everyday erasure then begins to happen in what kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. um, possible after independence. And the South African experience shows us that they used categories that I do not believe reflected the nature of the liberation war of South Africa. So one of the other examples that, you know, Raymond Sadna uses that I love, and I, and, and I did interview Mam Tozi Memela Kambula. She is um, the MK combatant who infiltrated um, Sipiwe Nyanda, uh, retired General Sipiwe Nyanda and Mac Maharaj from Swaziland for Operation Vula. Operation Vula was MK's last operation. But sometimes people will say, oh, but was she really in combat? Was she really a soldier? You know, she says, you know, I received partial training. But as Sadna argues, 
what do to mom do to mom had to do I mean, they call it reconnaissance. She had to judge and map out exactly the steps that Maharaj and Nyanda had to take. If she made a mistake, they, they could be killed as they enter South Africa. So she had to experience the danger before them. How do you then say someone like that was not in combat? And you, you then say, oh, because she didn't have the same military training as Maharaj and Nyanda, then maybe she's not a combatant, even though she was also in exile. So that is part of the very systematic erasure, even before we go, in, go into writing the work. And I think a lot of queer theorization is about excavation. It's about saying they were there. They did the things that they say they did, you know. How do you think we can better, you know, avoid um, this kind of erasure um, in whatever kind of wars? Um, and I know you probably have ideas of the kind of wars that are taking place at the moment and, and how we are fighting them in ways we are not aware of. Um, and I want to ask how we can better avoid the erasure of the contribution made by women and, and queer people. I, I do wish I had a more optimistic uh, response to that question, um, because what I've seen, certainly in the literature on Umkondo Caesar, and we, we don't have enough of, uh, you know, of the PAC, you know, um, is that actually, you know, there's a saying, right, that it is the victors that write the accounts of the, of the war. The experience, you know, of, of the South African experience shows me that I don't think that's all necessarily true. There, there is more work, more books, more memoirs being written by former white South African conscripts than there are memoirs by former members of Mkondo Wesizwe, uh, of Apla, and even less memoirs by women. And so somehow, you know, the, the erasure continues to happen even when veterans are still alive. Of course, now I'm dealing with a situation where many, quite a number of the women I've I interviewed, you know, are, are passing away, you know. Um, one of them who passed away in December was the um, member, former member of parliament and former MEC uh, of health in the Eastern Cape, Dr. Pumza Gyanki. You know, and we keep saying we must do this work. So we are in that moment where if we don't do it now, there is, I, I, I mean, the erasure is already happening, you know. Um, and this is a country in Africa where we, the, the state does invest in research, you know, um, but somehow we, we are not seeing uh, volumes of work. I mean, I look at the literature on, on women in the um, liberation uh, 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 movement in Zimbabwe, there's, there's more there than we have here, you know. The people that were active in the 1950s and the 1970s, you know, what they did remains elusive. I mean, look at the figure of Charlotte Matake that we still mm. have few works um, on Matake. You know, people were active early 20th century. What more than for those who were at the heart of it in the middle of that uh, century. You know, I was very encouraged last year that um, through the work of feminist researcher in, in Stellenbosch, Uhuru Palafala, you know, through the work that she did, you know, this um, uh, anthology, you know, these poems that were first published in 1981, Malibongwe, by South African, uh, it's called Malibongwe, Poems from the Struggle by ANC Women, which was not available in South Africa until last year, you know, is now available. It was republished by Ushanga. This is a book where, you know, people like Baleka Bete, uh, you know, published in. Um, two of the women that I interviewed also published here, Dr. Pumza Gyanki, uh, who was Alison Zonga, uh, Belinda Martins publishes here, Many of some of the familiar faces and some that we don't know, you know, published this book um, in um, 1981 under the, the leadership of uh, Sono Mulefe, whom we know as uh, uh, Ambassador Lindwe Mabuza. So these kinds of victories, because I consider it as a victory, do give me hope that if we sustain the work, 
then the, we can push against the erasure. You wrote such a wonderful essay called The Personal is the International. For black girls who've considered politics when being strong isn't enough. And in there, you mentioned a lot of things, but the, I thought one of the most interesting ideas you mentioned is that the African worldview um, and the feminist view um, present with us an opportunity to imagine a new and kind of inclusive international. Um, what do you mean by this idea that the African worldview and a feminist view can contribute to um, the idea of a new a new understanding of the international. Mm -hmm. There's this um, Caribbean feminist, um, Tanya Hands, who um, shared this quote uh, by uh, another Caribbean um, celebrated um, thinker. Uh, some claim her as feminist, some say she hasn't claimed to be a feminist, uh, Sylvia Winter. And there, I want to read this. Um, you know, Winter says, the tremendous transformation of global warming and climate change has enabled us to see that as long as we continue to all want to be good men and women of the Western bourgeoisie kind, wherever we are in the world, we will destroy the world. We will destroy the planetary environment and therefore our only possible habitat as a, as a species. And so I think what I was trying to say then, you know, was that, you know, we've all been raised in these ideas of neoliberal success, neoliberal progress um, that are based on accumulation, you know, that we must master our environment, you know, but not really master, but actually plunder it. But how Africans have lived, and I think this is why the South African government decided to use the term of Ubuntu as the guiding principle of their foreign policy. Whether they practice it or not is a different question. But what, you know, South Africans, Africans, you know, uh, must have seen, see all the time, is that we have lived side by side with our environment. I mean, that is why in our daily, in our daily lives, you know, we don't consider our departed, our, our, our ancestors as gone. You know, we, we regard the way that we behave, you know, as, as actions that our ancestors can see. So if we are abusing each other, abusing our envir environment, our ancestors will punish us. That is part of our worldview, that we don't see ourselves as superior to, to nature. Um, but that is completely in contradiction to this neoliberal Western masculinist view. And I think this crisis, this pandemic, I mean, China has become, you know, that place where capital gets cheapened goods. And we thought all we get are these cheap goods. But of course, for anyone, you know, I mean, we know that many Chinese end up, you know, uh, migrating to other parts of the world in part because of the legacies of what that uh, form of intensified industrialization has done to the Chinese environment. I mean, you know, people in, in Asia, especially in China, have been wearing masks long before this crisis, precisely because that very abusive, uh, plundering industrialization has ruined the environment. So you can be rich and have all of these things, but you actually can't breathe. It's not sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable for Africa as a form of progress, of development. So as we even talk about this African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which also emphasizes industrializing, we must begin to anticipate that we might be facing the same form of economic and in that, um, uh, environmental uh, consequences that countries in Asia, especially so China, have begun to face. For one, COVID has, has uh, shown us is that states remain the most dominant actors in the world. The idea that over 100 countries applied lockdown measures tell us that we are still having to deal with these states that we cannot trust to provide us with security, to provide us with public goods. 
they can tell us to stay home they can if you are black they can shoot you if you don't do it we are still locked in that we have not begun to think ourselves beyond the state even as we know that the state has not offered africans i don't know any african country that we can say this is a model african country on how you can decolonize a european westphalian state we have not done that before i let you go i wanted to ask um about your current work what you're currently working on and what we can further expect from you in the, oh the near future i am uh, finalizing uh, my manuscript on women and the armed struggle in south africa um, that is what i hope to share um, in the not so distant future i'm very i'm very excited for that i'm very excited for that and and lastly what's your advice and word of encouragement to you know thinkers out there who are concerned with the state of our country i would wish for them um enriching community um and that is the people that you are thinking with you know because for me what often intrigues me about uh, any writer is is being able to pick out you know pick up who is surrounding them who are they are friends who are their elders you know uh, i'm not a fan of the word mentor but i, I prefer the word elder who's who's around this person um because i think you know um you know many of the questions that we think about unfortunately um i think we, we will leave this world you know with this with this problem still um happening i mean um Obama in an interview was evoking, you know, James Baldwin and many people are saying, "Oh, you know, James Baldwin, you know, described what happened, you know, in America, you know, um and and what that tells us about the legacy of Baldwin's work is the importance of honesty, the importance of integrity. And so to say difficult things in your lifetime um that others then, you know, may may begin may 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 hold true. you know decades later and so the feminists that i read so if i you know i, I speak often to you about my dumas work and part of the gratitude you know i had and i didn't know uh, if you are my dumas for instance i didn't know yehumi you know um i didn't know as uh, tabseng mutseme but part of the what their work has done for me is to say oh I am not crazy you know I am not crazy and so I think maybe the the advice is to also for one to find their um, their genealogy their elders and so I'm part of um a feminist collective doing a series called Inyati Buzo Baba Pambi you know and so we we learn from those who came before us and so that's how I look at the lives of the former women combatants that's how I look at the 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 the, the importance of the the work that um uh, the the uh, black writers you know queer writers who come before us um those that stand the test of time as of course now we live in a world where Toni Morrison is physically not with us but she's with us all the time with her language was that you know she she spoke the truth her, the truth as she saw it had the courage to do that and luckily for her she was surrounded by Maya Angelou by Baldwin by Nina Simone you know there's a quote i love by Nina Simone where she says what is your definition of freedom she says no fear no fear and so that's what i would wish for for a writer no fear that is so beautiful <laughs> thank you i can't, oh my god yeah. a rock star <laughs> and I want you to, I hope you are encouraged um to keep doing your very wonderful and important work and you know thank you so much for your generosity for your brightness and for not holding back um that brilliance thank you thanks and thank you above all for being my community you know <clears throat> thank you Love thank you. you for being my community
Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on this juice that I'll be squeezing out for you from these wonderful and very important conversations.